just take a nice, slow saunter and walk. I was just curious why you do things like you do, like the canary and appearing on RT. And why do you do this sort of thing? Um, I think for me, mm -hmm. what are the pretty much the most important thing that we need now is to change the story to actually change the narrative, almost like the paradigm that people are living in. What do you mean by story and paradigm? So you've got, you know, much of the mainstream media, almost all of it effectively, and most of the political parties, um, most of the voices that people are listening to in both of those spheres have a pretty negative story about kind of humanity. Yeah. You know, it's a fairly pessimistic worldview. You know, people who rely on the welfare state are cheats or failures. Um, you know, life is some sort of winner-takes-all, um, you know, jungle, competitive sport, you know, battle to the death, effectively. Um, and, you know, we conflate wealth with morality. <laughs> you know, rich, good, yeah. poor, bad. Yeah, it's true. Um, and almost the, the very idea of sharing and cooperation has, has almost become a sort of anathema. You know, it's, it's either hopelessly naive on the one hand um, or outright dangerous on the, on the other hand. Why dangerous? <clears throat> well, the idea that somehow sharing some sort of more socially democratic system would somehow strip people of their liberty. Oh, OK. Um, rather than give them the liberty to make the maximum contribution that they were capable of as a human being, yeah, yeah. which obviously in our personal lives, most of us know that the things that have really caused us advances have been when people have shared their knowledge, shared their skills, you know, shared their compassion and empathy with us when we've been at low ebb. Yeah. Um, given us an opportunity which otherwise wouldn't have presented itself. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're almost the sum total of all of the contributions yes. and experiences yeah. to our existence from people today and people in the past. So do you believe that when people say, I'm a self-made man, that they're talking bollocks, basically? Yeah, I think it's like a willful ignorance, because, and it, and, and it doesn't take away from, you know, yes, you, you know, go for self-reliance, always look to yourself first in terms of, you know, what can I do to, you know, improve my circumstances or help in some way with an issue that I care passionately about um, or create the kind of life that inspires me and I want to live. That's great to hold that view. Yeah. But I think to hold that view as if that and all of all that you've benefited from all of the inputs of people present and past, um, to ignore that reality I think is willful ignorance yeah. and extreme arrogance, frankly, you know, to, to say, you know, I did this on my own in a world which has been built before you arrived <laughs> is a bit rich. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> Good yes, come on! Everyone oh. needs a hug. Everyone needs a hug. It lives oh, it lives love it! <laughs> <laughs> Why you do the canary? Because you want to present a different, basically, from what I understand you're saying, a different a story, literally a story yeah. of, of the way that the world is constructed. Completely. So it's trying to essentially have, have the conversations mm. that are currently excluded from the mainstream space. Right. You know, conversations about, you know, how money works. You know, a lot of people oh, don't know how yes. money works. Conversation about how the banking system works, how politics works, why some of these decisions happen, and the context in which they happen. Right. So that you know, part, part of the problem I think in in the mainstream so much is that you just get this snippet of yeah. a thing happened. Yeah. These people are on welfare, or this many immigrants came to the country this yeah. year, or whatever. But there's no framing of that argument that, that helps people fully understand kind of the issues the behind the issues. Yeah. Um, and that's what we really want to do. So that one, we can kind of come to a better consensus about what the root causes of the problems are, then the kind of solutions that come from the alternative and progressive space versus the mainstream kind of neoliberal space right. actually then make sense. You know, you've, you've now got people to understand that the problem isn't what they've been told the problem is, it's actually something else. Yeah. So now your solution makes sense because it deals with the problem we now agree exists, which they didn't understand existed prior to that conversation. Because I believe and I think a lot of people recognise that, that life, emotions are basically seen to be split into two. Yeah. Between love and fear. You yeah. either act from a place of fear or you act from a place of love. And yeah. love being 
Um, <laughs> I, I know where she's operating from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think kind of the key thing you can see and a lot of the data that comes out of the OECD and the IMF and, you know, and these can hardly be said to be socialist institutions. They're fairly neoliberal in principle. <laughs> but even their own data, when you look at it, they've got um, something called the Better Life Index. Oh, yeah. You know, which examines people's quality of life across a number of measures. Right. Um, you know, everything from the fact that they've got a shelter through to self-fulfillment yeah. and actualization. You know, they're living the life yeah. they want to be living right now. Yeah. Um, and all of that shows that kind of the more socially democratic models where you really, really invest in people from the moment they're born yeah. to the moment they die, yeah. you know, from education, investment, free at the point, you know, free primary, secondary and higher and further education all yeah. the way through. Yeah. Um, so that you're giving people, regardless of the circumstances they start in, mm. the absolute best possible chance mm. that they're going to be able that to they live the life that they exactly to society completely in a healthy. So it's that, it's that phrase from from the Christian Bible, isn't it? You you give a man a fish he eats for a day, teach a man to fish, he can eat you know, eat for the rest of his life. That's kind of what you're saying. I, I find it so strange that sort of some people on the right tend to use that. Um, phrase as if what it means is that welfare is bad, as if the welfare state is bad, as if that's giving the man the fish. Right. But the welfare state exists to build the school in which that man would learn how to fish. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it's kind of, you end up in these weird conversations where you're thinking, how on earth did you yeah. take that from that life lesson? So, if you were chosen by aliens, <laughs> to plead for humanity not to be exterminated. Yes. How would you do that? How would you plead our case? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> How would I plead our case? I think I would kind of show them... It almost... You'd want, like, a video reel of our best moments, like a highlights reel or something. <laughs> You know, of kind like of what, though? well, there's like the what? there's the big moments, you know, like the getting to the moon, the exploring space, you know, the developments in telecommunications and science, and the fact that we've we're constantly, um, well, you can make a case that we're constantly finding ways to kill each other. We're often at the same time finding new ways to heal and save each other. Um, you know, be that emotionally or medically or physically, um, and I would want to show that, and I think just make the case you know, almost on that basis of we're flawed and imperfect, the same as any other species, but that doesn't remove our right to exist. If you look at the last decade for gay rights, you know, not only in this country, but across actually a pretty large chunk of the world, yeah. with some very heinous and notable exceptions, <laughs> You know, we do seem to actually be getting better at actually accepting people live their lives in different ways. And, yeah. you know, actually how much of each other's business are those issues about, you know, who we choose to have sex with as consenting adults, who we choose to spend our life with and the nature with which we conduct our romantic relationships. You know, the fact that women, you know, after campaigning for a very long time, still don't have equality, but we're moving in that direction. You know, and, and all of those things, it's like, you know, there is an evolution that's happening, uh. um, but evolution isn't linear, um, and it's not consistent across all areas. So is it that thing of, like you were explaining before, like some things go forward and sometimes regress and... Exactly, you know, things, you know, there are some things we look at and go, that's, that's moved forward in the last 50 years, you know, gay rights, women's rights, those kinds of almost social issues of social liberalism have seemed to ad advance, if that's something that you're happy about. Obviously, some people, that's, that's a regression. Um, you know, and on the other hand, you might have things that have gone backwards. You know, we have far fewer rights in terms of privacy now, in terms of civil liberties, um, in terms of human rights. You know, there has actually been a, 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 a quite significant regression yes, yes. Um, in the past sort of 30 years that's accelerated in about the last sort of 15, years, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, that post 9-11, you know, yeah. world for, for want of a better phrase. So again, how can you convince an alien not to exterminate us with, with appalling rights for women and for, and for men as well? Really. And I think that's the nub of it, because the moment you extinguished us, you would never realise that hope. 
the very fact that we aspire to that equality, the very fact that we have those dreams and ambitions and hopes for ourselves as individuals and as a species is absolutely the reason for existence. You know, it's so, because we will never realise those ambitions if you extinguish us. If you extinguish us, you'll just never know. You can go, well, they achieved this, they didn't achieve that, they did this, they did that. Yeah. But you never get the end of the story. That, that would be it. Yeah, okay. You would essentially be saying, I don't believe in any of the principles I hold to want the extinction of the human race. Because essentially that's kind of giving up and going, we're not capable of it. Those are pipe dreams. And I certainly wouldn't be engaged in doing what I do if I believe that. If, if the world was more of a matriarchy, like the elephants and the bonobo chimps, how do you think the world would be different instead of more of a patriarchy? I don't necessarily think kind of the any gender having some sort of control over the other gender is ideal mm. at all. Mm. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would think if there was a matriarchy, there'd be other problems or the same problems. You would still have a basic issue of inequality, you know, a structural inequality. So absolutely, you know, I think there's, I think it's actually a, it does a disservice to men, I think, mm. to assume that you know, by nature, somehow, you know, having a penis and testosterone makes you somehow less capable of making um, rational, emotional or um, morally ethical decisions. Um, and ditto, I think it's patronising <laughs> to women to to assume we, we hold some sort of um, greater burden of morality yeah. through virtue of having, you know, vaginas and a little bit more estrogen. <laughs> so, you know, I, don't, I, you know I, I really kind of am not about the gender binary. I think, right. you, know, I've, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by men and women who are phenomenal yeah. human beings. Yeah. You know, they're caring, they're compassionate, they know how to share their emotions, they know how to you know be with mine um, and and support me when I when I need it um, I don't experience a gender binary um, in that way I think a lot of that is actually social conditioning versus um, a binary I, I don't doubt the impact on people of you know their different hormones and their different biological makeup mm -hmm. you know obviously there is a difference um, but I don't think that difference is um, finite Mm. Um, and I don't think it's it's binary and fixed. No, I understand what you're saying. Because if someone described it to me as it's actually about the balance of the male and female within. Absolutely, and it's, as you say, it's this is you know start start with ourselves and pan it out. You know, it's, it, everything is personal and global. You know, yeah. it's, I think you know those things have to be in concert with each other. And yeah. I don't think we can ask any of the anything of the world that we wouldn't be willing to ask of ourselves. <laughs> So I just wanted to ask, while you were talking about the canary and it becoming more and more popular and more and more people becoming aware of it and subscribing to it and you've got more people hitting today than live in Iceland. <laughs> have you encountered any um, opposition or have, have they, you know, has the opposition tried to take you out you know, in the same way of, of the way that they kind of uh, spread the propaganda about, you know, loony left wingers, oh my God. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, we've, you know, we're still really young. This is only our fifth month. Wow. And it's, it feels like we've been doing this a lot longer than, than we have been. And we, our admission in our first year was not hugely ambitious. It was to, to grow our following, to establish our credibility, um, to, to essentially to say to people, this is who we are and this is what we, we're up to. Right. And then really spend year two and three expanding our original investigative journalism and really go out and start kind of hit, you know, hitting it in year two, year two and three once we've established ourselves. Yeah. What we didn't quite expect is that we would end up establishing, <laughs> establishing ourselves very quickly and people actually, you know, in, in the way we created it because we were feeling like, someone's got to do it. Like, why is no one do doing this? Um, and then we did it and people responded to it by going, oh my God, someone's doing it. So they, we, we'd almost answered a question that had existed. Yeah. Um, and people responded to us really powerfully that way. And obviously they, the people that wanted that responded to it and the people that didn't want it did the same. Yeah. So we've had, I think it was an article in the Telegraph that was, you know, called us the maddest left wing um, website in the world. And we were kind of like, thanks. <laughs> That's also an interesting thing about you, Kerry, that you kind of can see people who might be in opposition to your ideals and principles and beliefs, and you still seem to treat them with an open heart and love in your soul. 
Uh, how? <laughs> how do you not get overwhelmed by, you know, say, the paper you just mentioned that want to take you out and will kind of use every tactic to, um, uh, you know, I can't think yeah. of the right word, but kind of just, you know, bash you down, basically? I think it's that. I think for me, it's always about playing the ball, not the man, to use a, a football parlance for oh. me. That's a big principle, is that I will attack their ideas vigorously. Yeah. I will hold them personally to account for spreading those ideas vigorously. But I want to live in a plural world where people have different ideas and we tussle those ideas out in a democratic way. Um, and the one, you know, the one of us that's most compelling to most people wins, mm -hmm. you know, for the period that we're here. And then a whole new generation comes in and, you know, they, they do their thing. So I don't want, you know, I, for me, there's enough anger, there's enough upset in the world as it is. That doesn't mean I don't get angry or upset. It's just that to me is always the catalyst. It's not a permanent state. It's I'm angry, I want to do something about this. <laughs> well, too bright, then. <laughs> so I've got just five or six questions, quick five questions. Um, what the world needs now is more... Love. The world would be happier if... We have more love. <laughs> <laughs> In ten years' time, I hope to be... Oh. I literally cannot even respond. I don't think that far ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, if I was to share one beauty tip, what would it be? <laughs> Spiky hair rocks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your favourite singer is? Alanis Morissette. Uh, Meryl Streep or... Um, oh, God, I can't think of her other name. Meryl Streep. <laughs> I love the sea. It's so... There's something really cathartic to me about the sea. Yeah. <laughs> Saying to someone the other day, it's kind of, you look at it for, just stand there and look out for 10 minutes. Yeah. It's about the equivalent of a day off. Yeah, it is, <laughs> it is.